The year is 2015, the year that I came out to my family. Now, my family was extremely supportive and I'm very lucky to have them. They're an important part of my life and I love them very much. But even with a supportive family, things can get very uncomfortable when you come out of the closet. Because it's a huge change for everyone. And it's kind of a half step. You aren't fully out to the world, it's just that mid-step where you kind of start coming out to people. And let's just say that for a while, that awkward middle phase was basically my entire life. Every little piece of trans story and trans news was part of my family. It was necessary for us to absorb it. Not just for my family just to understand what my experience is like, but for me to get in touch with my community. And in the middle of all this, a movie came out. A movie by the name of The Danish Girl, directed by Academy Award nominee Tom Hooper and starring Academy Award winner Eddie Redmayne. Watching the trailer, I was nervous, but quietly I hoped it'd be an important portrayal that I needed for my life. Something that could push me forward and inspire me. Years later though, when I finally did check it out, by that point, I knew the critical consensus and I knew that wasn't what this was going to be. The tongue lashing it got from trans critics was universal. People hated this movie. And after I saw it, I could see why. It felt like an oversimplification, a stereotype, and most of all, a misrepresentation. Hello everybody, and welcome to episode 2 of my series on trans women in cinema. Now when I first started this series, I knew there were three films I had to cover. Three. Now the first one was Dallas Buyers Club, a film full of tokenization that I saw right when I came out to myself, but not out to anyone else. The second was The Danish Girl, a film that came out right after I'd come out to my parents, but not out to the world yet. And the final one is Girl. A film that I saw after I had gone full time and was out to the entire world that exploits the trans experience. Now we'll get to Girl one day. Trust me, I'm planning on it. But first, I wanted to approach this film. And why we need to talk about Lily. And why Danish Girl is a problem. To summarize quickly, the Danish girl tells the story of a famous painter whose wife, also a painter, needed them to stand in for a woman she was using as a model. At first reluctant, the painter, who would eventually go by the name Lily Elba, eventually relents and decides to try the woman's clothing despite presuming herself to be male. Despite her reservations, she finds herself electrified by the act. Eventually the couple decides that because Lily hates going to gatherings so much, she should present as a woman instead. And when she does just that, she goes out and has an amazing time. After that, Lily starts to question her identity, falling more and more into femininity. She eventually reaches a point where she can't bear it any longer and decides she needs to be Lily full time. Lily and her wife approach a surgeon who is able to perform an experimental procedure to give Lily a vagina and a uterus. The first surgery becomes a success and Lily goes on to live her life as a woman happily. However, when she can't take it any longer and decides to get the surgery anyway, it ends up not going as well. And shortly afterwards, she passes away, leaving her ex-lover to spread her ashes to the wind. Now listening to this, you may be thinking, this doesn't sound that bad. And in concept, you're right. But it's all in the execution. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Now it's important to remember that the Danish girl does not come from a trans woman's perspective. See, it doesn't come from direct accounts of Lily, but instead, a 2000 fictionalized version of Lily Elba's life, written by David Ebershoff, a cis man, and then chosen to be produced and directed by another cis man by the name of Tom Hooper, who then decided, hey, we should cast the trans role with a cis man named Eddie Redmayne. Now, the general populace kind of accepted it and said, good for Eddie. But trans folks were not happy. This was just coming off Jared Leto's Oscar win. 
and people were just tired of this. The problem with casting Redmane isn't just that it takes away a job from a trans woman who could have used it, though that is a problem. The problem is that it implies that trans women are men, and thus applies a male perspective to Lily, as seen in this clip from the Netflix documentary Disclosure. Having cis men play trans women, in my mind, is a direct link to the violence against trans women. And in my mind, part of the reason that men end up killing trans women out of fear that other men will think that they're gay for having been with trans women is that the friends, the men whose judgment they're fear of, only know trans women from media, and the people who are playing trans women are the men that they know. We were never men. Implying otherwise is an insult to gender identity and to ourselves. This isn't a one-off example either. Tom Hooper spends the entire film prodding the audience to see Lily as masculine or fetishistic. The portrayal of Lily seems to inherently paint her as a masculine figure invading a feminine world. Redmayne attempts to capture Lily by showing her mimicking other women's movements, including a scene where she visits a strip club and behind a glass screen attempts to mirror every movement of the dancer. While all behaviors are learned and some trans women do have this experience, there's something about drawing attention to it that adds a feeling as if we're gawking at her. The film views Lily's mirror of other women as an impersonation, not a learning experience. With a real trans woman in the role, maybe this would all feel less fake. Maybe it wouldn't feel like a picture of a man trying to be a woman. Instead, just a woman learning behavior she was never taught. But with Redmayne in the role, it just feels like an act. And then there's how the film sexualizes Lily in the process. The film lingers on shots of quivering bitten lips, lots of sexual encounters in women's wear, and an infamous shot of longing as Eddie tucks his penis, and well... It's all just so sexualized. The sensation of touch more than anything is overplayed to a point of parody, and the lingering hyperfocus of the camera on the body feels like something out of a porno more than something portraying a longing to be oneself. Now, sexuality is healthy. I'm no prude at all. I recognize that sex is an important part of life, and sexuality is definitely an important part to discussing queer theory. But it's different when it's being forced onto a community by a director not part of that community. Say, in this example, a cis male director forcing it onto the trans female community. It frames us as a sexual spectacle for cis people, and it doesn't allow us our own continuity or empowerment. And unfortunately, this isn't the only place where the trans experience is misrepresented. Throughout the film, there's an evil, evil question being asked of the audience, and that is, is Lily being selfish by transitioning? And I'm just gonna say straight up right now, no she isn't, and we need to stop acting like she is. Nobody, and I mean nobody, is selfish for being trans or trying to transition. It is not selfish at all, and implying otherwise is denying a person of their personhood. Do not do that. That said, there is a reason why the filmmakers are asking this question, and that's because they're not approaching the story from Lily's perspective. This film is not about Lily. At least, not technically. See, The Danish Girl is actually about Gerda Gottlieb, Lily's then-wife. The film is about how Gerda, ahem, dealt with and survived her partner's transition. At its core, the film paints Gottlieb as a woman ruined by her spouse's decision to transition. The film focuses on Gerda's pain, lingering on frowns and fights where the audience is clearly meant to side with Gerda as often as possible. You should have been there. How could I? Look at me. Not everything is about you. While it is a film empathetic to Lily for sure, if you were to map who it favors throughout the movie, it definitely lean heavily towards Gerda. She is, after all, the cis audience surrogate. The centering of Greta in the film's story makes clear that the Danish girl was never made to tell the story of a trans woman and how she experienced the world, but to use her story to evoke feelings of pity in the cis het populace. Nothing is more obvious of a representation of the cis het populace view of the trans community than to supplant their own selfish feelings about trans people into the story of a trans icon. It isn't Lily's story, at least not fully. It's shared. That sharing avoids ever having to fully dive into Lily's experiences as a trans woman, something the film will never understand. And then there's that one pesky trope that always gets in the way. If you're trans, you know what it is. 
trans lives as tragic figures. The short popped up in Dallas Buyers Club and now it's popping up here. Now this isn't to say that there shouldn't be tragic stories that involve trans people in them, but in media, that's basically the only narrative trans women get. It makes it appear as if our lives are nothing but suffering and pain, that we are figures to be pitied. By discussing only the tragic portion of our lives, you belittle our experiences and resort them to a simple narrative that reduces all of the complexities of the system we deal with, our own internal struggles, and our own accomplishments. You need depth to truly convey a person's experiences, and diminishing these stories to a simple tragedy of living one's truest life is disgustingly basic. To quote scholar Kael M. Keegan, The Danish girl does little to disabuse viewers of the assumptions that transgender people are tragic and that our bodies are medical anomalies. The film instead passively sanctions these attitudes by removing any historical reference to a theory of why Lily exists, even though European sexologists had developed a robust literature about sex and gender variation by the early 20th century. Representing the diversity of these theories would have explained Lily's feelings and offered the audience a way into identifying her as a specific kind of woman. Instead, the Danish girl erases the existence of any but the most damning and pathologizing literature pushing the audience to view Lily as a doomed sacrifice to history. These films take away our voice for the most basic stories and water it all down for the masses, never taking into account that this doesn't help us be understood, or it creates more confusion, more misunderstanding, and more stereotyping. We are more than tools for your story, and I think it's time we had some real stories told. So who was the real Lily Alba? Before I go any further, let's be perfectly clear. I do not mind when a film is inaccurate to its source material. Films like The Social Network and Amadeus aren't meant to be completely accurate and I don't think they would gain anything by being so. They're films about bringing emotions to the surface that become overpowering when amplified with a few little white lies. I don't expect them to be accurate, I expect them to be entertaining. You know, see, my issue is when a film takes a great story from an underrepresented group and just decides to just water it down. That is where I tend to have problems. Most Space on a True Story films add elements to scintillate and complicate the story, to make it more thrilling, powerful. And there's a certain class of these films dedicated to taking these stories from oppressed groups and making them as easy to sell as possible. Movies like Stonewall, The Blind Side, Green Book all find a way of simplifying stories down to simple, easy to understand narratives that an audience can supposedly relate to more, and it cuts out the drama and power of more complex emotions that could have elevated these stories. Changes serve to hurt the story more than anything, and that's kind of what happened here. Let's look at a real account of Lily's life, not the fictionalized account that came from the Danish Girl book, which was published in 2000, and is again, a fictionalized account of her life. Instead, let's hear it straight from Lily. There was a memoir that came out two years after her death by the name of Man Into Woman, and it contains actual entries from her. Once you know the true story, you'll realize that the film's depiction of Lily's relationship with Greta Gottlieb is mostly inaccurate. See, in the movie, Lily's transition destroys their marriage to a point where it is unsavable because she decided to be this way, where Greta is still in love with her. In real life, Greta was bisexual. She painted very explicit photos of women making love to other women, and the fact that her new wife was a woman wasn't the issue. They just weren't really in love anymore. They were going through different phases of their life, and they decided to be friends instead. Greta went off and married someone else. It's that simple. Their marriage was annulled, and it was over. The movie also adds in Lily having an affair with a man while she's still married to Gerda. In reality, she remained pretty loyal to Gerda throughout her entire life until their marriage was annulled, then she got another partner, once the surgery was finished. In the movie, the concept of Lily's dysphoria and euphoria is kind of left on the table. There's only really a few scenes regarding it, and most of them are the sexualized scenes mentioned earlier. But in Man Into Woman, Lily describes something. Now, we can't say for certain that it's dysphoria, but it certainly sounds like it. She's having a conversation with the doctor that she would later see for her surgery, and she describes feeling a pain throughout her body, something related to her gender. And it's described like this. Pronouns and names have been changed to be more respectful. She wanted to say something and fumbled for German words. You need not give me any explanations. 
The professor interrupted her considerately. It hurts here, doesn't it? And there, and likewise there, doesn't it? And his hand slowly glided over Lily's body. All that Lily needed to do was nod quickly and shyly. An almost terrifying astonishment gripped her. How did this strange man know where her pains were located? Yeah, in Lily's memoir, there's even a discussion on Lily's natural femininity and how comfortable she felt. It was also strange that when Lily found herself among Gerda's lady friends, who, like herself, were artists almost without exception, she felt the most feminine of them all. At first, the friends laughed somewhat heartily at this fact, but gradually observed that Lily's feeling was genuine. Despite its title, this film barely explores any facets of the Danish girl. Her life progresses and she decides to transition more and more, but we don't get to see much of that. What we do see is painfully inaccurate and sloppy. So where does this leave us? Now, I wouldn't say the Danish girl is vicious or malicious. I think we'll talk about much more infuriating examples of trans representation later on. But it's incompetent. It's incompetent at telling a trans story, despite assertions to the contrary, and frankly, that's worth bemoaning enough on its own. To quote an IndieWire article on The Danish Girl from film critic and friend of the channel Carol Grant, For a film that's being touted as a progressive step up for transgender visibility, everything about its view of trans women and women in general is regressive, reductive, and contributes to harmful stereotypes such as the cis-normative idea that a trans woman is simply a man performing faux femininity as Redmayne twirls and vokes his way into womanhood. The reductive portrait of a trans woman as a figure of pity, whose tragedy stems from being a man unable to practice womanhood rather than accepting her womanhood as natural fact. The argument that TERFs love to perpetuate that trans women only reinforce outdated gender stereotypes, the leering at a trans woman's body as something unnatural and abnormal instead of inviting the audience to understand our dysphoria, what should have been a celebration of a very complex, compelling transgender figure is instead trans misogynist and just plain old misogynist in general. However, the more time passes, the more backlash these types of films get. Trans storylines are still being written by and for cis people. That hasn't changed exactly. But for once, these films are starting to get heavily criticized for doing just that. Trans people are getting trans roles more and more often. And often, the cis people who do receive these roles are heavily criticized to a point where many of them have dropped the roles altogether. Things are starting to change. And I don't think that would have happened if people hadn't stood up against the Danish girl. Lily Elba as a figure did not get her due in film, and that's a real shame. But her real impact on the community will not be forgotten, because she was only just the beginning. Millions of stories that have been and will be told in the future. Ever since I started rapping, I put a target on my back. I just thought I should be smarter than I am for every bullet that they shoot. I'll take it harder as I can. I just thought this shit was harder than I planned. Fuck it. If they want me, they can come get me. Gotta take this unleaded mix with a shack that's bloodshed. I'd like to take a moment to give special thanks to my $10 a month patrons Corey Fui Maona, Eric, Trent Maldier, Megan Gruberman, Cameron Kanaki, and Paige. My brother perished for my